Welcome back to the Loss Prevention News Network. I'm Joe LaRocca. You can always follow me at LaRocca J or my esteemed colleague who it just seems to be taking the afternoon off, Amber Bradley. You can follow her at my calibration. But for this segment, I'm thrilled to be joined by Garrett King, who is the, I'm going to get this right. Business <laughs> Development Manager. Cam, Cam, Business Development Manager with CAM Connections, the Division of Protection One. Thank you so much for being here. Of and course. your repeat guest. Yeah. Um, I just have to start out. Last time you wore the, the Florida fluorescent color. And yet today you're joining us in white. That's really brave given Thank all you. the food and snacks running around <laughs> this room. So, um, Garrett, I just have to say, you're, last time we spoke about technology, you were really on the cutting edge of the things going on in the industry and what mm -hmm. the retailers are looking at, what Protection One is up to, et cetera. Um, now, I, I'm going to share a little bit of declassified information that okay. um, having, uh, uh, now that we're doing the, confer uh, the conference in Washington, D.C., so this is the benefit of live TV, you get people crossing. Yeah, camp. thanks, Reed. Uh, yeah. So, uh, um, so a little bit of D-class information. Uh, you visited the National Counterterrorism Center today. We did. We can't. I know you can't talk about it at all, but I'm sure you saw some great. Um, it was a great learning TV experience. Learning it was a great experience. learning experience to see uh, how the different agencies here in Washington D.C. all are interact with each other and share information and. Um, take reports current live from media and their own sources and accumulate them and then discern them out to the, the meaningful parties to address them, which protect us and the people that go and shop in the stores. And they have the really, as you said, they have everybody sitting right in the same room. A, they a do. They have professionals, if you will. 17 different agencies all in the security sector working together within a room with hundreds of TVs and monitors and computers just taking thousands of reports in hourly. They. They did say we could share. They have 9,000 reports a day wow. coming in in wow. a 24-hour period. Imagine Meaningful that. reports. Meaningful, right. Yeah. Meaningful. It's bubbling up to them mm -hmm. through a SAR or something else. Exactly. So um, tell me, so take that experience. And obviously, you've, you've done your fair share of looking at um, companies that are building EOCs within the organization or even third-party or operations. Mm -hmm. um, P1's got a robust operation, but so do many other um, commercial providers. Where, do, where would you recommend a retailer start? So I'm building an EOC in my small retail company and I just need a, a stream of information. Talk to me about video, talk to me about setting up the system. As retailers, we already have most of the information you're probably gonna need to make some basic decisions through an EOC. So it's start small, have a plan, know the people and chain of command that you wanna run through it, and then start some small exercises where you can say, we need these information coming through here. We only want four people here to start disturbing it out. And then we know where it's gonna go and how we're gonna make the decisions when it gets out there. So it's really about a chain of command and putting the right people in the room in the very beginning? It is, it is. You don't need a lot of extra data coming into an EOC. You can have cameras and burglar alarms and all of the simple physical security stuff. And then you have stuff like CNN and Weather Channel and some other things that are really easy and cheap to get a hold of where you can start something from a single desktop monitor in a room where you can just gather together and work as a team and know the plan. Or you can do something really huge where you have, you know, 5,000 square feet and hundreds of people in a room to, to do it as an operations center. Right. It's really what fits best, uh, both financially and from a point of attack. Right. So you don't you don't need to build the NCTC. In you do your, not. Uh, NCTC <laughs> in your uh, in your corporate facility. You do not. So talk to me a little bit about where technology is headed now. I know in the last time we spoke, we we talked a lot about video storage and NVR and even cloud to, to some level. Mm -hmm. um, how have things progressed over the last year and where perhaps are they going in 12 months? So those really, they, they storage has come down in price, so we see a lot of those things moving to the cloud. It's becoming more feasible for people, but a lot of the stuff we're seeing now is taking a lot of technology that we've had for years and using it to be more robust. So we heard people talking about Mac IDs and facial recognition and all those other things. And you just heard Bob say, matching them together, how do we correlate the data so right. we can use it to be more proactive or faster response to what we know is going on. So what, what I saw today, which was really cool and what we've worked on with some other manufacturers is taking Mac IDs from phones and Bluetooth and associating them to faces or scenes. Mm -hmm. And then so when you have an ORC ring hitting you, they're going to usually bring their phones with you. Right. So they go in, we know the moment they walk in there and you can have a plan in place for your store team to say, this is how we want you to react. And then from a corporate standpoint, you can say, this is how we're going to chase them down and we're going to be fast about it and we know where they're going to go and where they're operating. Right. So in, so in that scenario, if, if you were, 
in a, a store that had, had, you know, some sort of um, issue with robberies. It might be a pharmacy, a jewelry store, a cell phone company. You might look for the, the MAC IDs that are in the store at the time. You've identified now witnesses and potential suspects, mm -hmm. but when you start to see the same numbers pop up over multiple locations, we call that a clue, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, how feasible it is, is it to pull that information? And here's the, maybe the more important side of it. Can you really use that as evidence? What do you do with it? To, I, I'm, that's probably a better question for you to answer if you can use it for evidence okay. than me. I'll be the technology guy. All right. So, yes, we can begin correlating it. You can do something as simple as you can have an analyst begin looking at the data you get, and you can make your own decisions, or we can take some artificial intelligence technology, which we have, and we begin using that to, to correlate it down or give you better red flags maybe to view as the reports come in right. uh, or the information comes in. Um, from an evidence perspective, I know retailers have done it. Um, it's not always easy to get all the permissions um, from the third parties that might store the data, uh, but you can pull them, you can use it, it's been used for probable cause, and it's certainly a clue in the larger equation. It might just lead someone to say, yes, this individual was in the store during multiple incidents. So um, it's certainly very helpful. And we know that the people who are stealing from us, or the retailers, they're still shopping for their food, for their clothes somewhere. Right. So they're going to be a, no, a normal shopper at one point as well. So we get a better idea of maybe where they're living or what they're doing when they're not actively right. performing. Right. It always fascinated. I think we had talked about this one time that you're not, you're not always concerned with the person that's in your store. Sometimes it's the people that just pass by it. It's the mm -hmm. people that um, you know were in the vicinity but didn't necessarily mm -hmm. come inside. Where, so how do we take that data? And even outside of it, inside of loss prevention, because we own it in some cases, how do we take that to the sea level and say, we have something you can use. This is something we could benefit from. Yeah, yeah you have to get buy-in. That's a huge piece. You have to get buy-in from, from the sea level, not just from the people that you might report through from asset protection above, but you have to get marketing and operations and everyone else to really understand and trust what you're doing is going to be of value, and that it can not only protect people, but help the business grow and sell more, too. And will they pay for it? And will they pay for it? That's always the, the, <laughs> the big key there. And now let's fast forward. We're looking, you know, two years out, five years out. And I know you're you're constantly looking at the future. What do you see on the horizon? Where should where should someone shopping today be focused in terms of their st future strategy? That's, it, that's a hard one to predict because we don't really know where retail is going to truly be two years, five years now, or the technology that might come about in the next six months. The, I think the biggest key now is we have so much at our fingertips is to use it more than we do now. So we put technologies in stores all, the, all day. Right. We might only use 10% of what it's capable of. Or taking that and furthering it, just like PVMs have been around for, for 20 years now, right. taking those and making them more productive and more useful for not only the store level asset protection individual, but a corporate individual as well. What can they do and what can they get from that piece of... Makes sense. And a smart practitioner is going to pull all the pieces of that together mm -hmm. and come together, come to the table with some actionable information to improve mm -hmm. the sales and also reduce their shrink. Try and truly yeah. integrate the system so you can get the data across all aspects. That's great. Garrett, thank you so much for spending some time thank with you. us. And uh, I'm Joe LaRocca. Thanks for tuning in. We're going to turn it back over to Gus Downing right now.